Thank you so much for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Ahead today, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu with some harsh words for President Biden when it comes to advice about Israel's war against Hamas as Israel considers its next move against Iran. And we have a special report on the opposition groups against the regime inside Iran. Hezbollah launching more strikes against Israel as the Biden administration's special envoy arrives in Beirut for ceasefire talks amid word that Iran also wants a ceasefire. Here in the U.S., how Big Brother really can be watching you as America has many surveillance cameras per person as communist China and a deadly milestone and dangerous warning as the Russia-Ukraine war hits 1,000 days as Vladimir Putin puts out a new statement on the use of nuclear weapons. All those stories and more are ahead right now on CBN Newswatch. This is CBN Newswatch. We're going to begin this Tuesday in the Middle East, where Hezbollah is keeping up its rocket attacks on Israel, launching more strikes today with several people hurt in the central and northern part of the area after attacks on Monday. That coming as the U.S. envoy for the ceasefire talks arrived in Beirut today. And in Israel, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had harsh words for the Biden administration in a speech to the Knesset Monday. In a speech to Israeli lawmakers, the prime minister criticized President Biden and his advisors for faulty judgment and policies, including trying to stop Israel from an offensive against Hamas in the southern Gaza city of Rafah. If you go in, you will be alone. He also said that he would stop armed shipments that were important to us, and he did so. Several days later, Blinken appeared and repeated the same things, and I told him, If we have to, we will fight with our fingernails. Israel has been warning Iran of devastating consequences if it attempts any further attacks on the Jewish state. As Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem, the regime also potentially faces a greater danger within its own borders from a number of opposition groups. Recently, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu spoke directly to the Iranian people. Yet there is one thing Khamenei's regime fears more than Israel. You know what it is? It's you, the people of Iran. That's why they spend so much time and money trying to crush your hopes and curb your dreams. Iranian-American filmmaker Human Halili is fueling those dreams through 18 banners posted throughout Israel, celebrating those women defying the regime. I wanted to, to inspire the women of Iran to keep fighting uh, because what they're doing takes so much courage to show their hair. And when someone gets murdered, I don't want them to be forgotten. One school of thought is that the Islamic regime could potentially collapse without a war. One believer is Yigal Karman, founder of the Middle East Media Research Institute, or MEMORY. For more than 25 years, Carmon, a former IDF intelligence officer, has helped bridge the language gap between East and West by translating multiple languages in the region through memory. No one wants war. No American president, Trump, will not want war. No one. We don't want anybody. Can it be done without a war? The answer is absolutely yes. Carmon explains part of that is due to Iran's multi-ethnic population. Iran is made up of 50 percent, almost, Parsis. The 50, other 50 percent are ethnic minorities, which are repressed for many years by the Islamic regime. And they struggle for their freedom, for rights, for autonomy, for confederation. Some want even independence. Despite that quest for freedom, Carmon sees the West doing little to help them. The West is not helping freedom fighters, true freedom fighters, Baluchis, Ahwazis, uh, Kurds, and Azeris. And there are more, but smaller. These four groups, ethnic groups, seek their freedom, fight for it. Carmon stays in regular contact with many of these leaders. We are even publishing, uh, giving them a platform, publishing their material. Uh, lately, we published a, an article by the Dr. Arif al Kabi, who is the leader of the Ahwazis in south of Iran, old uh, region of the oil. 
It's a beautiful article, a dream of peace and understanding and of freedom. Freedom of the control of the crazy Ayatollahs. That's the only name for them. That's why Karman believes the West should get more involved. They need to be helped. This will remove the Ayatollah's regime like that, if the West helped them. Any help ending the Iranian regime would transform the Middle East. And that's a dream Netanyahu wants the Iranian people to believe. I have no doubt that one day in a free Iran, Israelis and Iranians will build together a future of prosperity and peace. Chris Mitchell joins us now from Jerusalem with more. So, Chris, what can you tell us about these opposition groups inside Iran? Well, I think this report kind of, uh, you know, lays bare, uh, Ephraim, that many people uh, don't expect this of Iran. They think it's homogenous and that it's just the uh, mullahs. But uh, they're just so, as uh, <clears throat> Yigal Kaman said, just ha half of the people there in Iran are Persian or speak uh, Farsi. And I imagine a lot of people outside of Iran haven't heard of these ethnic groups, the Azeris, the Kurds, Balachis, the Azawis. They're all fighting for their independence uh, inside Iran. And as he said, they are the true freedom fighters, uh, you know, fighting for freedom from the Ayatollahs. And uh, they are looking for help from the West. And Yigal Kerman says, <clears throat> as we said in our report, he's doing little to help them. And he's not just talking about moral support. He's talking about weapons and he's talking about arms. And he thinks this will have a great impact there inside Iran right now. And as we saw, Netanyahu spoke directly to the Iranian people. And and hopefully this dream uh, that he talks about that the Iranian people have could uh, could actually turn into reality. Uh, many people see if it this co combination, this connection between the uh, Iranian people and the Israelis is really uh, maybe 2,500 years old. People would call that the Cyrus Accords as opposed to the Abraham Accords. There is an ancient connection between Israel and Persia. Netanyahu says all of Israel's current wars on seven fronts go back to one source, Iran. And he says Israel will review its, opposite, its options on Iran when President-elect Trump takes office. Trump wants to avoid wars, but would a strike on Iran's nuclear facility still be possible? Well, Ephraim, you know, given the danger that a nuclear round poses not just to Israel, but also to Europe and especially to the United States, as Iran calls it, the great Satan, uh, it really does seem possible given a new Trump administration. Uh, but so far, Iran... Uh, Iran hasn't shown any uh, ability to strike back at Israel with any success. So perhaps that's another region, region uh, why Israel and the U.S. may think it uh, an attack on their facilities. Uh, Iran struck uh, Israel on October, 3rd, um, October 1st, April 13th, and they didn't succeed. And then, as uh, Netanyahu told the Knesset, uh, you know, they already struck a secret nuclear facility. He admitted that on his, uh, uh, in his speech to the Knesset. It was a key facility that may have set back Iran's nuclear program uh, substantially. And, you know, over the years and over the decades, actually, uh, Ephraim, Netanyahu has really been a voice crying in the wilderness that uh, about a nuclear Iran. Some people see a sim similarity historically with Winston Churchill, how he warned Nazi Germany in the 1930s. And perhaps with Trump in office, Israel would find a willing and able partner to finally destroy Iran's nuclear facilities. Chris, Hezbollah is reportedly agreeing to a ceasefire, but nothing is final. Is Iran pushing them to accept it? Well, that's what's being reported, that Iran wants them to agree to a ceasefire, uh, move north to the Litani River. But on the other hand, that Iran would continue to support and help them rebuild. And I don't think that's uh, something that Israel wants or many people inside Lebanon. Uh, right now, Hezbollah's infrastructure in southern Lebanon, Beirut, throughout Lebanon, it's really being, uh, you know, destroyed systematically. Uh, Israel, in terms of the ceasefire, is demanding that they would have freedom of movement to hit Hezbollah after a ceasefire, if necessary. Uh, but Lebanon s seemingly would reject that as a violation of its sovereignty. Uh, you know, some of the details that have been published uh, would be uh, implementing U.N. Resolution 1701, and then it would be overseen by a U.S. general and a French general. Uh, but we'll see what happens uh, as uh, the days go by. 
Netanyahu had strong words about uh, some bad advice from the Biden administration when he spoke to the Knesset yesterday. Do many people agree with his basic tenement that Biden would have steered Israel in the wrong direction? Well, many people have been saying that uh, since October 7th, and especially when uh, Israel went in the ground uh, in Gaza, they micromanaged the war. And if you understand the political context, in the middle of a presidential election, uh, the, the progressive wing of the Democrat Party opposed the war. They opposed going into Rafah. They put pressure on the White House. That put pressure on Israel. Uh, which had a limited arms embargo. And many people believe that this influence on Israel slowed down the war and actually, in, in essence, cost both Israeli soldiers and Palestinian civilians' lives. Let's look ahead now to Jerusalem Dateline. What will we be seeing? Well, I remember we're going to have uh, that interview with uh, Governor Huckabee and Gordon Robertson. Uh, we have a report on what's happening in Le Lebanon. We also have uh, an interview with Joel Rosenberg, and we have analysis uh, from him of what's happening here in, in the region from a biblical perspective. And the question to ask is, are we in a birth pang, uh, a birth pang that Jesus talked about would happen in the last days in the Mount of Olives uh, just behind us? All right, our CBN News Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell, thank you so much for your insight. Know that we here continue to pray for you and our team there. You can see the key news from the Middle East on Jerusalem Dateline on the CBN News Channel tonight at 8 o'clock Eastern. You can also watch it on the CBN News Channel or you can find it on YouTube. Coming up here at home, how Big Brother really is watching you. America has many surveillance cameras per person as communist China. And police departments in our nation are combining these cameras with facial recognition technology to track everyone. We're going to see why some call America a, quote, surveillance prison when we come back. Americans live in what some call a surveillance prison. We are being tracked by a multitude of groups through many devices that we use. Vast amounts of data about us are harvested and sold on the open market, sometimes on our own government. CBN's Dale Hurd has the story. Many of us are under surveillance at this very moment. No warrants are needed and no laws are broken. The most obvious culprit is all the cameras. And America has as many surveillance cameras per person as communist China. Police departments from New York to L.A. are combining these cameras with facial recognition technology to track everyone. You're also giving away your personal information about where you are, what you like, even about your mental health, without even realizing it. Every click, purchase, and like is harvested and sold for profit by data brokers feeding a growing digital advertising market that is close to $1 trillion in value. Even your car tire sensors allow you to be tracked. Byron Tao is the author of Means of Control. A lot of that data ends up in the hands of data brokers, and those data brokers make that data available for sale to researchers, to marketers, to companies, and even to governments. So it's very, very difficult to escape um, the kind of logging and surveillance that modern technology brings along with it. It's being called surveillance capitalism. The internet is now a prison. It's a surveillance prison. It is owned and operated by private capital. They want access to our contacts. They want access to our calendars. Well, lots of app developers take that information and they suck it up. They vacuum it up. They know who your friends are. Um, they know where you go. Um, so that kind of information is available for sale. Your data is also being sold to the police and the federal government. A product called Fog Reveal allows police to create what are called patterns of life on a person and to possibly track them without a warrant. The government is also continuing to use a backdoor in the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or FISA, to spy on Americans, which is supposed to be illegal. But what really bothers Dave Moss, the director of investigations at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, are all the license plate readers used by police. This is one of the most pernicious and offensive technologies in the United States. It is misrepresented to the public in such a way that people think it's doing one thing when it's actually doing another. 
So for your audience, license plate readers are cameras that take a picture of your car and digitize the license plate as well as other elements to it. Your bumper sticker, the color, make, model, year, whether you have damage to your vehicle and uploads that to a central database along with where your car was seen and when. So a police officer can sit down at a computer and type in your license plate and see everywhere across the country that your vehicle was caught on camera, sometimes going back years and years and years. The license plate reader went off on it and said it was a driver's license restraint. So it looks like on here, so it's, she has a suspended driver's license. That can be on any screen on the computer, and if it hits on a license plate, it'll pop up. It doesn't matter whether you are tied to a crime or not, they're capturing it on everyone. And that allows them to track you in real time. They can add you to a watch list and just watch you and get alerts every time you pass a camera. A Duke University study found that data brokers are also selling lists of people with depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, and PTSD, all harvested from medical apps and websites. Constitutional attorney John Whitehead says this is all a clear violation of the Constitution's ban on unreasonable searches and seizures. The Fourth Amendment's dead because on their phones and their laptops, they have all this information on you. It's called predictive policing, and they're watching everything people are doing. There have been some ingenious attempts to thwart facial recognition. However, none of these work. The surveillance of Americans is an issue that should unite both the political right and left because we're all losing an important constitutional protection. If you care about something, then you should be worried about surveillance. I don't care what the issue is that you care about. It could be gun rights. It could be the rights of Palestinians. If you care about something, surveillance is going to harm your rights. We asked the FBI if it's still buying the data of Americans. It did not respond. The question is, can Americans roll back the surveillance state when data harvesting is now such a large part of the economy and so little is being done to stop it? The issue has been raised on Capitol Hill, but a new law this year only protects Americans' data from being sold to some foreign governments. Tao says consumers need to realize that most of the apps on their phone are trying to gather data to be sold. Beware of granting apps location permissions. Use only encrypted messaging services and search engines that promise not to track you. You can also delete your phone's advertising ID, which can be used to track your habits and movements. And you can buy services that remove your data from the marketplace. For there to be any fundamental return to privacy in America, however, Experts say Americans are going to have to demand more change from Washington. Dale Hurd, CBN News. The war between Russia and Ukraine reaches a milestone. 1,000 days of destruction, violence, and heartbreak as Russia makes a new announcement about using nuclear weapons. We're going to have that story for you right after this. As the war in Ukraine marks its harrowing milestone of 1,000 days, the human toll continues to mount with countless lives disrupted, cities reduced to rubble, and the daily realities of conflict weighing heavily on its people. As George Thomas reports, Russia's attacks are intensifying as Moscow lowers its threshold for using nuclear weapons. In a makeshift maternity ward in the basement of this hospital in Kherson region, Rosa Anatova cradles her newborn baby, Amelia, tightly. All the plans we had before the war, we decided that there's probably no time to postpone anything for later. We had to live for now. Despite the fact that the war continues and despite the consequences in the city and in Ukraine in general, we try to hold on. For her and for people across Ukraine, today's milestone is another sad reminder of how 1,000 days of fighting have led to immense human suffering, with millions of lives disrupted, cities in ruins, and the toll of military casualties growing daily. Every day we live in Ukraine is a miracle. In Kyiv, a memorial has sprung up in the heart of the city, dotted with Ukrainian flags, each honoring a soldier who died fighting Russia. Svetlana Kirichenko came to place a flag to remember her fallen son. I put the flag so that someone would pass by and see that this person lived once, gave his life for all of us. 
Despite heavy losses, Ukraine has continued to fight in the face of escalating Russian attacks. With two months left in office, the Biden administration is now helping Ukrainians take their fight directly to the Russians. The White House has allowed Ukraine to use American-supplied long-range Army tactical missile systems. This would be the first time they've been used to target inside Russia, and significantly inside Russia. The missiles will be deployed in the Kursk region, where Ukrainian troops are facing Russian and North Korean forces. It's limited to Kursk, and it's limited, of course, to the amount of missiles that we can get uh, to Ukraine uh, in the near future. So it is a substantial step, but it might not change the battlefield that much. The Kremlin is warning that deploying long-range missiles is only adding fuel to the fire. Russia's president updated his country's nuclear doctrine today, saying that he has the right to use nuclear weapons if attacked with conventional missiles by a country backed by a nuclear-armed nation. George Thomas, CBN News. Amidst all the tragedy and difficulty in the world today, it is always good to hear something hopeful. And we'll be right back with an encouraging word for your day ahead. Stay with us. You're watching CBN News Watch. Welcome back. Time for your Tuesday Tweetable. And today I share this word in hopes you will post, tag, tweet, and share it with those in your circles of influence. You were born for more. Your life is more than your work. It's more than your bills. It's more than your pains. God has purpose and plans for you, far more than you can imagine. With that word, I want you to make this a terrific Tuesday. That will do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. You can always find more of our news programs on the CBN News Channel. You can find them there at any time as well as online. That address is CBNNews.com. Take a moment, let us know what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can email us, newswatch at CBN.com. You can also reach out and touch us on Facebook, Instagram, and X, formerly known as Twitter. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Goodbye and God bless.